Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, guten Morgen and uh, um, uns uh, willkommen. I had four years of German in high school. It's not showing. Um, well, welcome to Haystack again, uh, Europe 2019. Um, so, a little quick, quick bio here. Yes, this is me in my 20s. Any windsurfer in the room, by the way? Germany used to be big in windsurfing years, years ago. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so basically, um, um, I'm from uh, Charlottesville, Virginia. This is where I live and, and work. And of course, as you know, all Charlottesville is one of the epicenter of search relevancy, you know, after Cambridge, sorry. Um, so I joined, I joined this fascinating field of search just three years ago um, as a long, after a, a lifelong of windsurfing, I mean software development, uh, doing the other database stuff, you know, SQL. I still miss a little bit of relational algebra from time to time. But the unique uh, challenges uh, that I have encountered in search thus far have really continued to challenge me. And so today, as, as a search practitioner still learning the ropes, uh, I'm really honored to give this keynote address here at Haystack EU. Um, I am a European. I was, I was born and raised and educated in France, so this moment is a little special. This is also my first time in Berlin. I actually have a, a family here. I have a nephew uh, who is studying architecture, so this was nice to connect with him. By the way, this picture was taken on the French island called Ile de Ré on the Atlantic coast just south of Bretagne or Brittany. So I'm glad to report it's about 115 of you today uh, from about uh, 50 companies, 10 countries will be treated to eight talks uh, today on a variety of topics that no doubt will, will continue to keep us excited about our field. We also have training classes tomorrow and the day after on thinking like a relevance engineer. Let me thank my OIC colleagues. These are the friendly faces behind your host today. And I'd like to thank OIC for welcoming me to their family a few years ago and, and sending me to this conference today. All right, well, let's get this show started. So, Lucine is 20 years old. Happy birthday, Lucine. No, I'm not saying this to show that Lucine has got some kind of advanced age. Uh, it is not advanced at all. Um, successful technology can be uh, lasting for decades. Um, and so I'd like to celebrate uh, Lucene's 20, 20 years old anniversary. So Lucene is mature, field proven, and, and reliable, lean and mean search uh, engine that embodies decades of information retrieval uh, R&D. Uh, its renowned inverted index is probably unrivaled today in terms of its efficient disk space uh, and search performance. Uh, it has triggered vibrant um, open source communities around Lucene itself, but also Solar and Elasticsearch. Uh, we have built applications in a wide range of, of domains, um, and uh, such as you know, e-commerce, education, library type systems, uh, legal, medical, etc., uh, both in the public and, and private sectors. It's been a really extendable platform. Um, where the innovation has been pretty remarkable. Every time I've gone to a conference uh, over the last few years, I've been amazed at, at you know, witnessing the kinds of things people have built with it. Uh, we've invested just about everything uh, with it. <laughs> uh, text, of course, but uh, maybe sounds, uh, images, um, concepts, uh, and, and as of late, vectors. We'll talk more about vectors later. It's been scalable. Uh, we are seeing uh, systems with hundreds of nodes, uh, with, with content approaching billions of documents. Um, and of course, you know, we've tweaked and tweaked and tweaked again in relevancy until you know, we ran out of money or, or our faces turned blue. And, but that's what we do, and that's what we're here to talk about. And the technology keeps getting better. Uh, and the community keeps growing, and here's a good example of this community, you all. So if we kind of tally up the years of experience in this room in search, I mean, I don't know what the number would be. It would be many, many years. By the way, if anybody is interested in writing version three, release three of this book here on the right, just let us know. I told you, Charlottesville is the epicenter of search relevancy, so Harry Hatcher actually lives in Charlottesville, the co-author here. All right, I think the tooling is awesome. And as a new search practitioner, you know, I'd like to kind of show my appreciation of this toolbox 
uh, if you allow me to do that for about a minute. I'll start with the Lucene JDK, we've, which I've had the, the pleasure to work with recently. I've been working on the query parser for a client. And you know, I used to be an enterprise Java developer in a past life, and I've been very impressed with their composition model for query construction, uh, where basically you can nest you know, the different query components. Um, and you know, what's been pretty remarkable is as you traverse a parse tree of some sort, you know, it's coming out of the, the, you're parsing the query, it actually makes it really easy to build the query, the Lucene query recursively and kind of nest these objects. So really kudos to the, to the designers here. Generally, the Lucene JDK is very approachable. It doesn't, it's not a huge framework. You know, it's not something that you activate through Java Spring or something like this. So it's certainly, uh, it's been a factor to its success, basically low entry to barrier. We've also enjoyed a wealth of these text processing widgets, right, that we, we know and love and use every day. You know, we've got characters, filters, and tokenizers of various forms and specialties. You know, we have all kinds of ways to remove, add, map terms in our token stream. Uh, we can perform various linguistic operations to, to normalize our text with stemming and limitization. Uh, we've got some natural language processing capabilities to do parts of speech and entities recognition various forms of engramming at the letter level or, or character level. We've got a really nice payload feature uh, to create and associate custom attributes to your tokens. And of course, you can write your own if you, if you can't find in the catalog what you're looking for. And actually, writing your own token filter is surprisingly easy as well, uh, thanks to the pluggability of the, the platform. And talking about pluggability, we are living within a very rich plugin ecosystem, both Solar and Elasticsearch. And so what kind of plugins can you write? All kinds, of course. We just talked about token filters, but also query parsers. That's pretty common if you have a custom syntax in your query. Uh, uh, maybe less common, some similarity algorithms around custom scores, perhaps. Uh, highlighters are always fun to, to, you know, custom highlighters are always fun to write. My colleague Max has some good stories about custom highlighting development, uh, so talk to him if you're interested in that. Um, and then just lately, something that kind of blew my mind is at the last Activate conference in the US this past September, somebody built this custom solar query handler, request handler, that allowed several independent searches to be executed and basically the, result, the results combined. So people do some pretty amazing things. And then of course there is scripting. So if you're not a Java developer, this is pretty much the environment in which you live. Now this is actually a snippet of actual production code for a client. And you can either view this as being beautiful or horrific, uh, depending on your personal experience with scripting here. Uh, a little fun fact about this, uh, as I was working on this, my mentor, who is not here unfortunately, but very good mentor at OSE, I kind of drove him crazy, because he, you know, he, at, at some point he said, Bertrand, stop Stop coding, this is configuration, this is not code. Now, of course, as, as a software developer, I, you know, this is what was given to me, and so I, you know, here I was, coding. The truth of the matter is that it is code through configuration, and we were fairly successful in implementing some pretty complex business rules around various forms of uh, strengths of matching. But the point is uh, that you know, I do want to recognize this solar DSL, you know, domain-specific language that's available to us with which we can do a fair amount of complex things. Then we're also doing AI. So we're kind of part of the cool kids doing, you know, the cool people doing AI. Uh, we, we're increasingly taking advantage of um, sort of the ready-to-use technologies that machine learning, deep learning uh, have been uh, you know, offering to the, to, to the community for about the last decade ago. We seem to have come out of the last AI winter, you know, when you learn about this expression, AI winter. Um, and, you know, the, there's been an explosion of open source uh, toolkits, libraries, online classes, many, many examples of how to use these things. And certainly Search has been an avid consumer of, of these technologies. And we'll see more, you know, in the coming, coming years here. Um, and so what are we doing with AI? Just a couple of things I'll mention. Of course, we're doing machine learning or learn to rank, right? This is actually a, a specific technology that we at OSC believe in. Our CTO, Doug Turnbull, here in the audience, is a co-developer of the Elasticsearch plugin for uh, learning to rank. We actually have a class on this. Uh, we do see an, an increasing number of clients using it. 
Uh, and, it was, um, and then the other thing that we're starting to see also is, is um, the use of deep learning techniques, neural networks, uh, to do things like classification, synonyms generation, query expansion, uh, auto suggestions, and recommendations. And, and you know, my source personally has been um, the book from Tommaso Teofili, which I'm currently running. Just wanted to call out his book because I've, I've been inspired by, by his, his book. Um, but how did this, this, did this all start? Um, you know, in any scientific or engineering uh, field, you know, we are enjoying the work uh, that, you know, we, we're resting on the shoulders of giant, you know, who before us have, have done a tremendous amount of work to, to give us the, kind of the state of the art we're enjoying today. And that's true for search as well, of course. So I'd like to spend a minute to kind of recognize their work, to, you know, so we can appreciate where we're coming from. So by the way, the picture in the back here is, oh, we can't see that very well, but that uh, is a patent from 1928, a German patent, uh, as a matter of fact, so just to recognize the, German the fine German engineering, about a search machine using uh, microfilms. So perhaps a good starting point if we go down memory lane a little bit, is to start with this vision laid out by Vannevar Bush. I'm sure you remember the name and the story, uh, who in the 50s, um, actually, not the 50s, 1945, uh, came up with his vision of this Memex machine. Now, Memex is, a, is what's called a portmanteau word between these two, these two words, memory index. And to use his own words, I'll just repeat the, the quote here, uh, so his memex, the, a memex is a device in which an individual stores all his books, records, and communications, uh, and which is mechanized so that it may be consulted with exceeding speed and flexibility. So I would argue that we're still trying to fulfill Mr. Bush's vision here. And although he didn't use the, you know, the terms such as search or retrieve, which we use, um, he used a more interesting term, which is consult, which to me tells me that maybe we need to, to kind of go back to that notion of consultation where it's more of a man-machine dialogue for search, right? Not just one search, but a series of, of, of transactions between man and machine. So let's fast forward from this seminal moment in computer science, 1945, from the Memex, and let's go through six decades of information retrieval R&D. Okay, you ready? So stay with me. So let's go through one slide, six decades. Um, and we'll start with the pre-60s. So in the pre-60s, people were mostly, you know, our forebears, our forefathers here, were mostly concerned about what's called a library problem. They were concerned about um, being more effective and efficient at creating index cards, basically. Uh, so we still had humans, librarians. Now, our, our roots, ladies and gentlemen, is in library. Any librarians in the audience? Oh, okay. One. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, and, of course, there was an explosion of knowledge after World War II. Lots of books and publications, tremendous amount of research. And so researchers in general throughout the world really had a need uh, to, to search for information. So the, the classic library techniques of indexing and searching just, you know, proved pretty uh, inadequate. Uh, pretty rapidly. So we see, of course, in the pre-60s, the beginning of the mechanization, to use Mr. Bush term here, of indexing and searching. We also see the early seeds of some of the concepts that we're still, you know, living with and, and using, such as vector space model and term frequency weighting. The 60s are extremely productive in terms of, of the, you know, building this foundation of information retrieval. Um, there is an interesting shift from sort of library-minded uh, crafting of subject headings and, and all other metadata on those index cards to let's just index the terms from the corpus. Um, this is also when we see, we see the introduction of the probabilistic term weight, you know, based on term fre frequency and, and the early intuition around the inverse document frequency, you know, back in the 60s. Uh, the uh, metrics that we use every day today, you know, precision and recall are actually defined back then. And then guess what? People use things like synonyms and stemming and stop words. 70s is more building up from that foundation. Uh, we start to see concepts such as, um, you know, doc to doc similarities, you know, essentially the more like this kind of feature we, we call today. Uh, 
a continued focus on the natural distribution of, of, the, of the terms in the corpus. Um, IDF is actually formally introduced by the researcher Jones in 1972. And then this TFIDF that we talk about all the time uh, starts really its career back then. And then there's an interesting quote unquote probability a ranking hypothesis that is uh, formulated back then, which I don't have time to, you know, we don't have time to kind of dig into, but to me the takeaway was that relevancy is a probability because we never know what its actual value is. So it's kind of interesting to think about relevancy as a probability. In the 80s, there's an interesting shift from just indexing and retrieving to the user focus. Um, uh, this, the researcher, Sarah Civic, is doing a lot of um, uh, user studies and has got some interesting literature around trying to define uh, relevancy. We see int uh, greater interest in natural language uh, queries because people you know, realize that search is essentially uh, trying to do you know, almost language translation from a query to actually what's in the index. And we see the first uh, best match uh, test here that comes out. The 90s, of course, is when the internet burst into the scene and changes everything. Uh, it's kind of considered by the uh, information retrieval community as a triumph because a lot of these web search engines that pop out in that period actually use some of the concepts and ideas that you know, had been developed over the past preceding decades. We see the first uh, text retrieval conference. There's more and more language modeling, right? We're still working on this. And of course, BM25 came out. And I don't think there's a BM26. Uh, and then, of course, Lucene came out in 1999. Did you know that Doug Cutting had written three or four search engines before Lucene? Kind of remarkable. So what are we doing today? Well, we're seeing an, uh, what I call the open source search engines blossoming. Of course, it was Lucene, Solar Elasticsearch. I didn't put Vespa up there because I don't know anything about it. <laughs> Uh, it's the platform has scaled up. We are building systems beyond just search with personalization and recommendations. And then even more exciting, perhaps, is this increasing influence or confluence of AI, machine learning, deep learning, really getting into our field uh, to try to help us with this search problem. And of course, if we took a sample of what you're working on today, that would be a pretty good representation of what's happening. All right, so that was six decades of information retrieval R&D. So now that we've gone over that, let's kind of take a look at what we do every day as a search engineer in 2019, right? So maybe we start with what we call recall devices. Actually, this terminology here came out of my research of the literature here. So uh, they talk about recall devices and precision devices. So maybe we start in solar config.xml. My apology here, that all the examples are solar, by the way, so my apology to the Elasticsearch practitioners here. So maybe we start with the eDismax. You know, it's like the Swiss Army Knife query parser, right? Uh, a colleague of mine actually calls it the shotgun query parser. Uh, so it's pretty good for, for, for recall. And, you know, maybe we've done a little bit of data modeling of our, our field. You know, we think that it's a good idea to kind of break, break the information down in title abstract body, this is just an example. And maybe we use our lovely MM parameter as a recall dial. We don't want to get everything, the whole world, but we don't want to um, you know, miss documents. So that's kind of how we start with that. Basically, a, a make sure that we get all the matches we, we're supposed to match. And of course, there's a tremendous amount of work crafting the fields and the field types, right? We, I'm sure we all do this on a regular basis. You know, we have to figure out how to tokenize. We have to figure out what sort of linguistic uh, normalization we need to apply. Stemming is always a problem. <laughs> uh, either too much stemming, not enough stemming, you know, it's kind of a struggle. So we spend a lot of time on these fields. And they actually, we, we iterate over these field, these field types, right? We, we don't get it right the first time, typically. And then we look at our precision devices. So we do things like um, we'll go ahead and perhaps uh, start with some boosting values on these fields. Now, why did, I, why did we start with five and two here? I mean, I, I have no idea. There's no science behind this. I mean, I've seen people start with single digits. I've seen people start with, you know, five digit numbers. Uh, and, and so that, that's kind of the, the, the challenge here is that we really don't know where to start, but we're starting at some point. 
And then maybe we, you know, we talk about the tie, right? So who is participating, you know, what fields are participating in the score? So in this example here, I want everybody to participate. Oops. Um, and then perhaps we also introduce boosting based upon uh, phrase clauses. We also use boosting there. Uh, maybe we have a slob for that. Uh, maybe we try to tease out these relevancy signals, right? This, this BQ is, is uh, trying to find out whether the query is actually a perfect title match. And if so, we'll get a boost on our score. Perhaps we also um, apply a time uh, decay function if our documents are time sensitive. And perhaps we also add another uh, boost around the, the distance. And so we got a lot of, a lot of dials and knobs to, to play with, right? As I said before, I think the tooling is pretty powerful. Um, and, and hopefully most of you recognize this sort of, this sort of work here. Now, the problem with this is that we get into this whack-a-mole game, right? We, we turn a dial here to fix something and then other things break, right? And, and we kind of we repeat this cycle of fixing and breaking and fixing and breaking. And you can do this for a while. Uh, up until you get to the point where perhaps, you know, the client is happy with the, you know, your, your relevancy. Um, but what this points to is really the need to have a methodology to remain sane going through this process, right? We are engineers. This is an engineering discipline. Uh, we need rigor. We need processes and, and above all, repeatability. And so... Uh, of course, a significant amount of, of research, uh, you know, has been around how to test, right? V very early on, back, if you, if you go through the articles around the Cranfield test, you know, they discuss a lot of the methodology. What test corpus to use, what queries to use, um, et cetera. So one of the things I'll call out that's something we like to do as, as consultants is, is talk to our clients about a process to go through this you know, fix and break and fix and break. Uh, and we call it the hypothesis-driven experimentation process. And what we're trying to do here is to proceed akin to scientific research where uh, we want to run experiments. Uh, short experiments, many of them, and we, the experiment goes as follows. We state a hypothesis based upon observations of the behavior of the search engine. Uh, for example, we might uh, make a hypothesis that adding a boost on title is going to increase relevancy. We make the changes, hopefully small. The experiment needs to be kind of pretty well scoped. And we deploy, hopefully, to an environment that is as close to your production environment as possible, which can be challenging if you have a huge corpus. You may not be able to, in your test environment, to have the entirety of the corpus. And then you run test queries, assuming you have test queries. And then you evaluate the changes. More on that in a minute. And then you repeat. And we actually call this the virtual cycle uh, in this process. Now, experiments are nice because, uh, you know, if they're, if they're small and, and well-scoped, we, we can run several of them. Uh, they're kind of accountable to management. We can explain these experiments to management. We can say, well, we want to try this. It's going to take, say, two weeks, and I need three engineers, right? So I can put a dollar number around it a monetary value around it. And management likes that. And then, uh, more fundamentally, I think what we like about these experiments is to actually fail fast. You know, try something, don't hesitate, it may not work. Try it, fail fast, you'll learn something uh, regardless. So, one sort of innocent bullet there was the, the, the step about evaluating changes, right? So this is where it gets interesting. Now, in terms of evaluating the changes, I like to break down between the traditional, you know, recall, and precision. So recall evaluation is to make sure that we basically matching what we're supposed to. And it's relatively easy because it feels like traditional functional uh, test oriented. We can, we can write sort of uh, deterministic tests here. We can automate them. Here is a query. These are the documents I want to match. And these are the documents I don't want to match, right? Now, of course, relevancy evaluation is much harder. We're trying to make sure that we're ranking properly and this is much harder because it's not as clear cut at recall test. If you think about the sort of automated test you may want to write here, we have to collect judgments, either human judgments from experts or non-experts, um, or, or collecting judgments from click logs, both of which are useful and are done every day, uh, but they're not without challenges. Uh, there are some 
metrics around uh, relevancy, DCG, other ones that can be somewhat confusing to the client. They, they, they tell you different things. Uh, they're all useful. Uh, it can feel a little bit as moving sand as well. Uh, relevancy is something that may change over time as the corpus changes. Uh, if the documents are time sensitive, especially in news, for example, you know, that's a challenge to, you know, these judgments actually will age and may have to be uh, updated. So this is kind of a constant care uh, of these judgments. And at the end of the day, also, uh, these judgments are only sort of sometimes a poor proxy of the actual judgment by the end users themselves. So maybe you still need a higher level, so that the business level, um, you know, business indicators uh, to tell you whether or not your changes uh, are, are doing something good. So that was a quick tour about what we do on a daily basis as a search engineer in 2019. So where do we go from here? We've enjoyed six decades of information retrieval R&D, and we're basically doing still uh, character sequence matching, term matching. Now we have a nice probabilis probabilistic term weight with the BM25, which has been proven to empirically, empirically proven to work quite well. Uh, and we've got all the tooling, you know, I've gone over quickly here. But search is not a resolved problem, is it? And so I'm kind of wondering if we've reached some kind of a plateau of tricks here in our great toolbox. Because we're only doing still term matching. And what about this aboutness that the researcher Moran talked about back in the 60s when he was examining the pros and cons of basically Boolean logic at the time? And he said, using his words, there should be some degrees of aboutness. Right, so are we heading in a direction of matching more on meaning, or are we still basically matching on character sequences? I would argue that we're still stuck with matching character sequences in the index, not so much on meaning. So I would like to propose here, as, as a theme, uh, to wrap up my keynote address is let's go back to the vector space model and see if there's something there that's better about aboutness. So let's go over what a vector space model is again, which actually is a term space model where we have a dimension per unique term in the corpus and then we place our document vectors like so where um, each, each vector has a coordinate on one of its terms and perhaps the coordinate is set to the term weight according to the BM25 formula. Then we place the query in that space, and it also has, you know, coordinates according to the term queries. And then the, uh, the similarity is essentially based on this angle, and so we calculate it using the cosinus, for example, or the Euclidean. Right? So basic geometry here, nothing particularly earth-shattering. Now, the advantages of this model over the previous or alternate Boolean model is that the similarity is based on this angle, which is more visually intuitive, although if you think about a, a vector space model that's got 100,000 dimensions, I think the visual intu intuition kind of goes away because uh, the vectors are basically very far from each other, right? Um, and then what's interesting also about this model is that, you know, if you think about the unit of measure here of similarity, which is the angle, right? Well, it's got some interesting mathematical properties because it's a continuous value. And then you can start doing things like, well, you know, I'm just going to, I'm going to have a cutoff. I'm going to say, I'm not going to return documents that have a similarity, an angle greater than, you know, 30 degrees. I'm just picking a number out of thin air here, right? Well, that's interesting because I had a client once who told me, well, I just want to cut off the documents after the score, the BM25 score of, you know, I looked at some examples. I want to cut off at 2.5. And I said, well, I'm sorry, I can't do that. 2.5 doesn't mean it's either relevant or irrelevant, right? You, you kind of get everybody and then you run back score, but the score in itself doesn't mean a whole lot. It certainly cannot be used to compare across different queries. 
Well, here it's a little different because we actually have an angle, so we could have things like some kind of cutoff. So that's interesting. Now, there are many issues with the term space model. Uh, it, of course, the, the, what's called the high dim dimensionality curse, uh, doing that dot product for the cosinus or the, or the Euclidean distance, you know, is an O of n square. Um, the space is sparse, right, low density. The vectors are very far from each other. Uh, and it's interesting because I, I, I did a little bit of research also uh, and, and found out that this, this intuition about how dense the space model should be back in the 70s, if, if you look up the work by Salton, the researcher Salton and his colleagues, they, they developed the intuition that a denser ve vector space model is correlated with better search performance. Um, the other issue is that um, there's no sense of terms ordering, right? This is, this is a very much sort of, um, sort of individual term uh, based, and, and there's no sense of context, right, in this model. And so context is pretty critical. And so how do we go from terms to context vectors, right? Now, context in languages is, is critical. And we all know, that, all know this as humans speaking one or several languages. We know that context is critical. Uh, the linguist first in the 50s put it kind of nicely here, right? What he said, a word is characterized by the company it keeps. So it's interesting that we've, we know this is true, and yet for decades we have not been able to introduce context in, in our ways to either match or, or calculate similarities. Well, what have we done lately? Say hello to embeddings, right? You've all seen what's going on there. So the idea being that we do unsupervised training of a neural network to uh, learn the context uh, based similarity between terms or paragraphs or documents. Um, the context is provided by the corpus. Right? And the context is going to be different from corpus to corpus, right? So it's, you know, if, if Doug trains a, a, a corpus uh, X and, and I can't use that on a corpus Y if they're different, right? The context is really corpus-based. And the neural network provides a function, right? Neural networks are these universal, you know, function generators that lets you associate each term to a vector or each paragraph to a vector or a document to a vector. And then, and actually, the, the, I should mention here, which is key here, is that it creates a dense vector. So as opposed to having just, you know, if the term space vector is 100,000 dimension, you know, a, a document may have only one, you know, in that vector, you know, just, just a few times. Um, here, it's dense. The vector is going to have all values non-zero, typically, in the list of values. Um, and that, that density is, is important for, for a couple reasons um, that I'll mention in a minute here. But what you, what you do with this is then, then you have now, you, you're in, you are in a space uh, vector model, and then you can, you can do similarities using cosine or Euclidean distance uh, for various use cases. So the challenge here that I'd like to present to, to you and the community is how we can go from term uh, space vector on the left, where each dimension of the term, to a, uh, an embeddings um, space vector, where each dimension is essentially an embedding, where the coordinate is the word to vec, for example, learn uh, weights. And you can see that the density here, going back to that, is reduced significantly, right? So, I mean, 100,000 for corpus unique terms, I don't know if that's a realistic number, but I just wanted to pick pick it for this presentation. A uh, hundred dimensions might be too little. I don't know. I actually have very little experience in this. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm hearing colleagues saying that maybe this is more around a thousand dimensions, but it's still very much, uh, very much denser um, for the embeddings. Now, just to kind of put this more concretely, um, kind of let me brainstorm with you here to kind of wrap up here and kind of look at what uh, an, a concrete uh, example would be of using these embeddings, right? 
So let's say that we have you know, a bunch of documents we're gonna index and we go through the classic text analysis to create a token stream. And then let's go through a word to vec training from these tokens. We create, so we train a word to vec model. Uh, perhaps we have, just for this brainstorming exercise, a very sort of um, crude aggregation technique to take the term vectors and, and uh, derive a document vector. And then maybe we feed that through a k-means clustering algorithm to now cluster our documents. So now we have a number of, of clusters. So we've, we've classified our documents automatically here. And then maybe what we do is we index, of course, our normal text fields in a normal way, but we create a new field, maybe we call it cluster or something else, right? Where we, we associate it with the document as cluster. And so now we have a new, a new inverted index called cluster. And perhaps we, we keep in the, in the posting here uh, the actual document vector and its you know, values up here. So that's an index time. And then maybe a query time, we take the query, we go through the classic text analysis, we feed it through the, the word to vec vector model that we've trained, we get our query vector, we position that query on the space. So now we see that this query is actually in cluster A and perhaps we use this information to create a boost query where, we, where the documents that actually belong in cluster A using a Lucene query parser on this field, value A, uh, will get a boost. And maybe the next level of refinement here would be to actually create a custom similarity class with a custom scorer to actually compute the cosine uh, between the doc and, and, the, and the query vector. Now, this is just brainstorming here to kind of open up the, the debate and the ideas. Of course, there are many problems. We have some significant challenges around the O of N square computation of the dot product. Uh, we also know that, that word to vec is pretty primitive uh, and, and is prone to false, uh, false positives, such as like if you do synonyms generation, you'll, you'll have antonyms, right? You'll have bad synonyms. Uh, but maybe that's not a showstopper. It's still worth a try. And of course, in my you know, quick brainstorming with you here, the, uh, the, I created a, a document vector in a very crude way. Uh, and so you know, that demands more scrutiny. So this actually will be my parting thought with you. Uh, that, that's a wrap. We've got a great show coming. Uh, today, we're going to hear from uh, our speakers on improving precision in e-commerce searches, users' intent understanding, mark of chain based recommendation, relevant facets, reinforcement learning based ranking, and learning to rank with Lambda Mart. So I'd like to thank you for being with us today. Uh, learn something new, meet some new people, share some ideas, and most importantly, have a lot of fun. Thank you.